Hey, good morning, everybody. I have friends over in the studio. This is my son, Brayden, my good friend, Jamie, and his daughter. Where are you? You're being shy. You won't be shy for long. Oh, <laughs> Jiminy Christmas. This is going to get rowdy. I'm going to answer Vienna's sewing machine questions, or at least some of them. I hope you enjoy this wild video. Let's get started. Welcome to my home studio. It's Sewing Saturday, and I have a friend that just got a sewing machine. Uh, Vienna, where'd you get your sewing machine? Um, a thrift store. That's, um, <laughs> that's a great answer. Now, later on, we want to encourage everybody to go shop at local sewing machine dealerships so they can get their lessons, right? Yeah. But right now, I'm going to give you a lesson, but I don't know what you want to learn, so I'm going to just ask you to ask me questions and see if we can teach everybody. Well, we'll see. Now, one of Vienna's questions actually already, and I'm just going to take over because I'm hyped up, I'm excited, and there's coffee on the set too, is I don't know if everybody can hear that at home. It's really stiff and really sticky already. And so I have stripped down the machine because I am a retired, I like that stuff. I'm a retired sewing machine technician, meaning that now I run around making videos. But yes, I went to years of school training. I know what I'm doing with a sewing machine. So please don't do this unless you know what you're doing with your sewing machine. But the concern is the noise, the squeak. I touch it, it feels really tight, Yeah. right? And, and was it sewing very well for you? Um, when it sews, it like screams, like it's super loud. Right. So you got to turn up um, the rock and roll when you're, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first thing is let's talk about a few concerns. Uh, right now as I'm handling the flywheel, I hear a lot of the rubber belt and the plastic here. So that to me isn't actually a concern, but I do want to go through and put some oil in here. Um, so I'm going to go through and there are spots, like I said, where po folks won't be able to do this at home because they won't have taken their machine apart deep enough. But I wanted to capture this on the video in case by just adding a few drops of oil. One, it makes it much easier to use. And two, it makes it more quiet because that's what the oil is supposed to do for the sewing machine, by the way. How long have you been sewing? Um, a month. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not long. Right? How great is that answer? No quieter. I would like you to handle the hand wheel because you need to know what your machine feels like, right? Because anytime a machine starts to get stiff and sticky and not feel good, it means the oil and the lubricants are drying up. If you get a machine that you don't know its history on, like an automobile, please just think of your, your machines like automobiles. You want to use it a little bit at a time and don't let it get too warm, let it get too overheated. So um, will you keep turning that a little bit for me and go ahead and stop, perfect. I'm also looking through here and one of the things I just caught an eye on and this door here opens on the machine, right? So this one I could have and I just found some thread caught in here and this is okay. Now, in Vienna's defense, it came over here with white thread on it. Yeah, I've only used white. <laughs> Black thread is what's in the machine right now. So this could not be. <laughs> Anytime we have thread caught in stuff, it makes things sticky and hard to turn. It binds things up. And okay, one of the reasons that thread gets in here though, let's talk about this. This is a good teachable moment. The truth of the matter is we always say don't run out of top thread because when you run out of the thread off of the top of the spool, at a certain point there's no tension on the thread, but some of the thread is still going through the parts of the machine. Once there's no tension on your thread, think about a fire hose without the firefighters on the end of it, Okay. right? That's what your thread's going to do throughout the machine. So this black thread that somebody else got, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So that's probably how it got loose in there. So while I'm going through, anytime I see, and we're gonna do this in the bottom of the machine as well, I'm putting oil in the spots that move that I can. And this is an older machine, more mechanical machine. So it's gonna have a lot more spots that are intended for you, the user, to oil than the newer modern machines, which are all but oilless. Or at least they're, they're, they feel like they're pretty oilless. Um, but they should still go in for a cleaning about every 18 months, maybe every 24 months at the longest. Okay, that would be like a new machine. But this machine that you didn't pay a ton for at a yard sale, and you've got a friend who knows about sewing, this is a <laughs> yeah. great experience for you, right? So we're yeah. not going to discredit what we're doing here. 
Okay, so one of the things I'm going to do now is I'm going to loosen the clutch over here. Because what does that do? Thank you for asking. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so the clutch, this part over here on this kind of a machine, is used to disengage this upper system. So when you're winding a bobbin, the needle isn't going up and down. The feed dogs are not going back and forth. The only thing that's moving is over here, this flywheel, so the bobbin can be wound on the mechanism that sits against this. So we want to loosen this, but when I loosen that, that means that the motor should be free and not feel stiff. It didn't change much. Go ahead and experience that for yourself, if you will. Doesn't feel much looser, right? No. It should have. Because, no. we, because if this upper part was sticky, when we disengage the pieces that are moving around, see now none of this is moving, mm -hmm. it's still kind of sticky. So that means there might be something going on down in the bottom por portion of the machine. So I'm going to take a couple of moments here and look for threads. I'm going to put oil in here. And then I'm going to put the machine back together real quickly. And then I'm going to actually come back to this bobbin area. And we're going to do that on camera for everybody. This is a real common area. And I think a lot of folks could benefit from that. But most people, again, won't be this deep in their machine. This is where the mechanic should be working. That feels really nice when just that part's engaged. So your motor is just kind of stiff. And your belt is just kind of squeaky. It's a rubber belt on a plastic part. So it's not a grinding noise. It's not like loose marbles. It's it's like ducks. Yeah. <laughs> so the machine itself is probably functional. So the machine's back together. Now this part I want everybody to see. The other parts I was talking about, you know, things that I do as a dealer myself. Right in here, what we're looking at is what's called a class 15 bobbin system. Not required to remember. Yes, you actually are required to remember okay. class 15 because when you go to buy the bobbins, every style of bobbin system has its own bobbin and its own bobbin case. This is the most common. That's why this is going to be a great part of the video. This is the class 15. If you can't remember the class 15 and you can talk to somebody like myself that can, if you'll remember yin yang. Yin yang. Yin yang. Let me show you why. So these are little wings or clamps that hold this part together so that all of this can come apart. The beautiful thing about this coming apart is this is what we call our hook. And on that hook, there's a sharp little pokey. Like really, go ahead and touch that, but carefully, please. Okay. Right? It yeah, is pokey, sorry. right? <laughs> but it gets a burr. Remember when we were talking, I can't remember if we were after whatever, it was your drama rehearsal or whatever, but we were talking, you're like, well, I'm getting loops, some of these weird loops on the back. If you have a burr on the back of this hook, it can occasionally catch the thread and not cause the thread to finish its stitch proper. So what I'm doing, not only am I gonna clean this out, but I'm checking right now to see if there were a burr. And if there was, you could take one of those soft emery boards like you'd use on your, your fingernails. Mm -hmm. Not the hard ones, it'll do too much damage, but the soft ones, yeah. you know, that are kind of spongy and you can kind of go through and you can just polish that burr off of there. So that's something that anybody can do and it's that pokey little part up there. And the reason I call it the yin and the yang, as hopefully folks can see, is half of this stayed in the machine and the other half came out in my hand, okay? While I'm here, I'm gonna use a dry brush and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna dust this out. Earlier, I took this out to my garage and I hit it with my air compressor, which had a moisture trap on it. You notice I did not say I'm gonna use one of those cans of spray air. Those cans of spray air are, I think, very, my opinion, but with a lot of fact behind this, they're CO2 propelled. So they basically, after about the third or fourth press of the top, they spit moisture. So you take moisture and you spit moisture plus dust, that makes mud at the back area of the machines, things you can't get to, that kind of stuff. So anyways, I'm just gonna dust this out like that, okay? And then this is a kind of a machine we always wanna be able to apply oil to. And there's a couple of different ways we can apply oil. This yin of the yin yang is gonna sit back in here, filling in the other 50%. It sat on this lower shelf. You see that okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a couple of drops of oil to that lower shelf right now. And I did a little more than a couple of drops because this machine is bone dry. But if you're doing this regularly, you're going to do drop, drop on each side. Okay. okay? Now, I know how to do this. This is for you to learn how. So if you will please put your yin and yang back together for me. That's it? I don't think so. You oh. were correct. You, you are correct. Okay, let's try it again. It was just, oh, yeah, what do you think about that one? 
Good. Okay, cool. <laughs> now, if you want to make sure, please grab the hand wheel, and you might even want to put your right hand over, or your left hand over here to hang on to it. Give it a little back and forth and see if it all moves correctly. Everything looking okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So now, um, will you rotate it enough that the needle comes all the way out of the area? We don't want to be working with our needle in there. Perfect. Okay, now this part here is going to go back on, and really, most of them always have this little shield over the top of it that kind of holds everything and it's the needle shield it goes this way um also if it's easy to remember those are the not those are the little divots that the black oh. notches hold in they won't be on the other side they're always going to have a little pin that's going to line up in the bottom area there too so with those three sets of instructions i think we got it now go ahead and see if we can push the black clamps over and if they both go in smoothly without much force, you know you've got it locked in perfect. Okay, so we've now put in oil in our bobbin area. That's really important. We've cleaned it out. That's something that all of you not only can, but should do about every five full bobbins. Okay, now let's see if this machine even runs at this point. I'm gonna remove the needle because I don't know where the needle's been. Okay. And if the needle's been bent, it might cause damage and we've just cleaned things out and we just checked to make sure there wasn't a burr on that hook. So we want to make sure the needle goes. And I actually have, this is something good for everybody to make. It was a pill bottle, right? And I just labeled it Sharps container, drilled a hole in the top. And so that needle's going to go in there forever and ever. Okay. We don't want to reuse needles for too long because needle, the needle and the thread is the gas in your automobile. The better quality, the better everything's going to come out, right? Yeah. So um, I have some fresh needles here. I have a variety of fresh needles based on what we're going to, hopefully we'll get to actually making a stitch here in a minute. But until then, I want to see the machine. I want to hear the machine run. So go ahead and plug us in, if you will, please. Okay. And then I'm going to hit that for the lights. We've got the light. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hold the machine stable, and I'm going to let you hit the gas. And let's just listen to this thing. Okay, I'd like you to go full throttle. I want to see if the machine starts to run faster and sound quieter because I just put all the oil through it. So a lot of times, think about this. This is like you just got out of bed in the morning and you're like, I just got to get to the Mr. Coffee. And then I've got the... Mm, mm. All right, kids, let's get out of here. We got to make the eggs. We got to, you know, and everyone's like pumped up and running again. So we should hopefully the machine will start to in about like 30 seconds sound and feel and actually be running at a higher RPM or faster for that matter. So anyways, I just need a little coffee there. Okay. Okay. So I got a good grip on it. Hit the gas full throttle, please. Oh, listen, go ahead. No. Did you slow down or did it slow down? Okay. If she had not slowed down, but it slowed down, that would be a bad sign. Okay. Go ahead and stop. First thing we want to do, grab the hand wheel, if you will, please, and turn it. Does it feel any better? Yes. Okay, so it's feeling a little smoother. Yeah. Okay, now are you ready for your first constructive criticism? Yeah. I'm sorry, but I have to do this. Okay. okay. This is what we do. The hand wheel on the sewing machine is always going to go counterclockwise. Okay. Okay, and I noticed it a few moments ago. So you've got the habit of turning it backwards. I want you to always grab it and pull it thumb over the top or elbow into your lap. Is how we do it. And the reason because, and mostly what we don't want to do is we don't want to go backward and forward with the hand wheel. Because if you go backward and forward, remember that class 15, that yin yang, it doesn't go in a circle, it goes back and forth too. Okay. So if you go back and forth with this, it might start to go back and forth with that. And then the loops of thread start to do things we don't want them to do. Okay. So we always want to go 360, a complete thing. So go ahead and grab the hand wheel and see if it feels better. Yeah, you did it, you got it perfect. Good job, Vienna. Okay, and oh, and I wanted to try it too. Oh, it does, it definitely feels looser. And so that was that oil starting to run through here. So, um, I guess we need to learn the proper way to thread it. You did say that earlier and wind the bobbin we were talking about. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's start there now that we know it's gonna run. We still wanna see if it's gonna form a stitch. Um, let me check your thread because you do have a wound bobbin. This was you, this was white. You've already <laughs> confessed to being the white thread. Okay. So it looks pretty good. It's not too spongy. It's not too gooey. If I pulled on this thread and like half of it shifted over to the side, like an old set of tires or something like in the Michelin ad, that would be a bad thing. So right now this looks pretty good. 
let's go ahead and make sure the machine forms a stitch before we rewind this. If I forget to say it later, I'll always take all of the thread off of the bobbin before I put any new thread on the bobbin. For the same reason as upstairs here, is we don't ever want too many loose thread tails whipping around down here. They'll also cause a mess. That's the advantage of the class 15 bobbin system. That's why they're in so many sewing machines. You at home now can take it apart when there's a bobbin mess. Still can't always take apart the top, but you can take apart the bottom, okay? So this bobbin, and this is called the bobbin case, okay? Uh, there's only one way they really go together. And when I'm done doing this, I want to pull on my thread and I want to see the spool go clockwise. Okay, clockwise. <laughs> which is hard to remember because I just told you this is going to go counterclockwise. Yeah. So there's none of this that actually all comes back and makes the same sense. So, but that is the rule to the bobbin and the bobbin case is that we always have the thread go clockwise. So I'm going to be terrible and I'm going to move this out of the way so everybody can watch you here on YouTube load that bobbin <laughs> case. <Okay. laughs> Aren't I rotten? Perfect. It's going clockwise. And now what I want you to do is please pull the thread. Yeah. That, yes. Now, can you feel that when you pull on that, there's a little more tension? Yes. Okay. So from here on out, if the machine is running proper, all of your sewing quality is based on tension. And tension is affected by the quality of needle, the how long you've been using. I said quality of needle. That is true. Uh, how long have you been using the needle, the quality of the thread. Okay. Um, and I will say this. Uh, Coates and Clark threads are very popular threads. They're not my favorite threads. Because a lot of sewing machines today use their threads like this sideways. And on these Coates and Clark spools, there's this wicked catch that as your thread comes around, it'll actually catch right there in the spool and you can't do anything, it'll, it'll lock up. So that is actually why that became my least favorite thread is there's a big groove on both sides and unless you use the proper spool caps or nets or whatever on your threads, a lot of times that will cause these erratic stitches. And when we're quilting and you look on the back and you see these erratic stitches, it's frustrating. So I'm not saying that it's terrible thread, but I don't love the actual packaging. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nonetheless, we'll use your thread because it should work. If it doesn't work, I'll try my thread. And if it works better, then maybe I'm more right about the thread. What I want people to hear in that sentence though, is when you're doing sewing, troubleshooting, you're doing science We're Okay. I'm talking too much today. What is the, what, what is the scientific theory? How do you handle the scientific theory? What is the big thing you do in science when you're trying to figure something out? Um, you take it one step at a time. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's what I'm going for. Yeah. Right. You can only change one variable at a time or you've blown your whole scientific experiment. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to start with your thread, change no other thing other than your thread. If we're frustrated, make sense. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So we have that, we have the bobbin. I guess we should talk to folks about how this is going to go on the machine. I assume everybody knows, but your bobbin case has this finger up here. I don't know everything. This, part of the bobbin case often will have a little hole in it. That hole, to my best knowledge, and I just said I don't know everything about sewing, is when you're using decorative and sensitive threads, sometimes like high speeds, I believe, you don't have the hole in yours. I don't really know exactly what to tell everybody if they have the hole in theirs, except for it's not used as a common practice. It's something for decorative threads, those kinds of things. It's, you know, so anyways, this does go up into the top. It actually falls into the last little spot on there where that shield was. I'm going to use this little lever to hold it. A lot of times that'll hold the bobbin in place if it catches right there. So I'm going to let you have that. And do you feel comfortable trying to drop it in upside down? The bobbin might fall out. Is it supposed to click? Um, perfect question. Okay. <laughs> and in case you didn't hear it at home, I've got weird mics everywhere. She said, did it, was it supposed to click? And we've all been told that over and over again, but the clicking sound is actually that latch going over the post, but you had the latch in the air and cause we had gravity, you put it all the way down. So when you let go of the latch, there was nothing to click. Okay. So great question. A lot of you have been told to listen for the click. What I like to do, and maybe I can even show better this way is I will pull on the thread. If it hadn't clicked, boom. <laughs> Ready for the click? Oh. Got it? There because it I had not held the latch that time. Great question. This is exactly what I was hoping you would ask. Um, we're going to have to get a good needle in here now. Um, let's just use a standard needle. And I've got a universal, a size 80. Um, 
so much to talk about today. Maybe we'll come back another time and talk about the details and needles and threads and maybe I can teach more sewing, sewing lesson if you'd like, but let's just get through the machine and make sure it actually runs. Okay. okay. Um, so these needles have a flat side, mm -hmm. okay? If you don't get your needle in your sewing machine proper, you can assume it's not gonna run very well, if at all, okay? So what I'd like you to do is this uh, needle is gonna go to the flat side. So I'm gonna bring this all the way up. Now there's thread in here. So I definitely want to make sure I spun it. Do you see I started to go in the wrong direction too? Because it was yeah. the closer way to the top. But now that there's thread in here, I need to go full cycle. And let's turn this around so everybody can see. This part right here is called the, that part right there, moving up and down. That's your take up lever. When it's at the very top, your stitch is completely formed. And so all the have you ever gone like where you're trying to pull and it's like it feels like it's bound and you yeah. can't get that's because this didn't finish okay. so when this is all the way to the pelican head we call that around the beach here when the pelican head when the pelican's helm stitch is finished okay okay so and now because of that see how much higher the needle bar is up so you'll have a no problem taking this needle with the flat side of the back and sliding it into place for us please okay. and then the I'm gonna, flat side in the back flat side in the back and i'm going to breathe down your neck to make sure you get it just right perfect now, if you'll, oh. yep, <laughs> switch hands so you can tighten the screw with the other once you get it all the way up there. Okay. okay, so hold it all the way up and then tighten that screw with your fingers, nice and tight. And I prefer not to do any more than finger tight, but one of the things I did ask Vienna to do was make sure that that was all the way up because if your needle is also not all the way up, it effectively changes the timing of the sewing machine because the needle's in a different position. So that was perfect. Now let's learn how to thread a sewing machine. Uh, this spool is just gonna sit up top like this. Now, as I come around, I'm looking and um, basically, if I know this machine correctly, it's gonna probably come through here and through here first. Okay. Did you have a book at all that came with the machine? No, because we got it at a yard sale, thrift store, something like that. Yeah. So basically the thread's gonna come through here and into this thread guide is my best guess. My fear is if I came right to the thread guide, it would loop and whip out at high speed. So I need to capture it down here. Now it's gonna go here. This is one of the tricky spots. And this is the one thing I can promise you on older machines. When you lift this presser foot lifter, right? The part that holds the sewing foot on, mm -hmm. it opens up our tension discs. So on the front of the machine, I have these tension discs. When I lift these up, it's actually opening this. We want our tension discs open so we get our thread all the way in there. So I'm gonna come around, I'm gonna take this, and it's gonna go into the groove, and then all the way back up. And actually at this point, because I don't have much tension, I either can put my thumb up here to get that to lock in. Deanna, did you see how that came around? Yeah. Cameraman, did we see how that came around? And I'm pulling all the way through because there's a spring right on my pinky right now that spring is now engaged with every stitch. If that spring is not engaged, that's another reason you're gonna get erratic loops on the back side of your project. So when that came through, okay, this guide keeps it in place. We come up here to the pelican head. At this point, we have a eye I'm gonna thread back down through that same track into this needle guide, or I should say thread guide, excuse me, and then at your needle, there's gonna be one or two, one on either side. I happen to usually use the one on the left side because I am right-handed. So two. <laughs> yeah, so it's just easier to snap right back in that way, okay? So that works perfect. Whenever we have a thread color change or we have a redo for whatever reason, we are gonna put the presser foot lifter in the up position again. I come up here and I cut the thread up the spool, okay? And I always pull the thread out in sewing direction to keep all the fuzz, all the lint, and everything coming on out of the machine. And to trick you, now your machine is unthreaded again and you're gonna to have to thread it for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But you don't have to say the words, you can just do it, how's that sound? Yeah. Oh. Yes, please, perfect. Well done. Okay. 
Now we need to put on the sewing foot while we're here. So I'm going to slide this over standard sewing foot, although not every machine is the same. You need to know if you're a high shank or a low shank sewing foot. So in this situation, if I come around here, I'm going to loosen that screw, tighten that up. Uh, Vienna told me on her way over that this often loosens up and that yeah. can be a problem for tension and things down the road. One of the things you do have a screw port here, we can tighten up this. If that gets tight enough, it shouldn't fall off. If it continues to fall off, please let me know. We might have to replace this screw. Okay. Anytime you're working with these small metal screws, if they're not going in very smoothly, they could be cross-threading, and that can cause them to basically destroy. And these are not screws you'll find commonly in those yellow boxes at Ace Hardware that I love so much. You know, <laughs> these are something you're going to have to get online, um, get at a dealership, get it, you know, from a, a, a salvage yard of old sewing machines a lot of times. Okay, so what I also wanted to show you, and this is something I want everyone to understand, when I said the presser foot goes up to open the tension, now when the presser foot's down, oh, this is great. Okay, here we go. Grab your thread, please. Go ahead and pull on that. I'm gonna lower the presser foot. Do you feel any change in your tension? No. Correct answer. <laughs> Correct answer. She didn't want to say no because that is the wrong answer, but it is the correct answer right now. Now, um, cameraman, do we see this number? Uh, zero. Yes. Yeah, we have. If I told you this is your tension system and you now see that your dial set for zero, are you as concerned as you were a moment ago? No. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Now, I'm going to teach you a trick. Uh, zero to about nine on the dial, right? So halfway between four and a half is standard tension. And so it's just so that you can crank your dial up or down. On a sewing machine, the bigger the number, the bigger the effect. So I'm gonna take that little red mark over here till it's at about four and a half. I'm gonna let you try the thread now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, let me try. Oh, that almost be, might be even too much. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to loosen it a little bit just because I kind of have a feel for these kinds of things. I'm, let's start with it at right about three. When you're dealing with tension now, we're thinking this might be a little loose. If it's a little loose, you're going to have more stitch showing on the back of the project. It's a tug of war. Okay. The project is the mud puddle and you do all your control from the top thread. So if I'm losing the tug of war and I'm ending up on the back of the project, I tighten it to bring more strength to the top of the project. Okay. If I've got way too much of the under thread, the bobbin thread coming to the top of the project, I loosen this to let slack back so that we just kind of split that mud puddle. The best way to test tension is with two different colors thread. Oh. That way, because it's really hard to kind of see in the stitch, but if you have a blue thread and a red thread on a white fabric, you can see all day long which side is our stronger team. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm dying to see this thing run, but we got to do one more thing, which is thread the needle. I'm going to cut the thread because we need a fighting chance here. <laughs> now, if you're not aware, there's what we call the lick it and stick it method. Okay. Yeah, which is kind of like, like <laughs> double dipping. There's another fun trick. I, I met a 90 year old blind woman who was still sewing. And what she taught me is if you hit this thread along the top, there's a groove in the needle. And then I get to a spot, it just fell right in the eye of the needle. Oh. And I didn't have to give any of my DNA away, right? <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. So that pulls through now. I'm going to just be bossy and reach in here. I'm going to hold my needle thread. I'm going to take one complete stitch. Quack, quack goes this machine. I'm going to hopefully watch that bobbin thread come through that bobbin door. Now it's up top. This is going very well so far. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to put both of those threads underneath the presser foot. I want to talk about something else real quick I've noticed. The machine has got a uh, missing a foot. So it's going to wobble a bit. So right now, like, you know, we just, we're going to have a little bit of pressure down. That's why I wanted to hold it when we're, when the machine's running. None of that is going to be a concern, but we can build a duct tape pad at home. You could put a little shim or something underneath there. You want it to lay fairly flat when you're at home, but we're not going to worry about that this moment. I'm just going to make us a real easy sewing sample, but I'm going to give us enough that we can take a few passes. Okay, so I've just folded it over a few inches, and I'm going to go ahead and drop the presser foot, and I'm going to ask you, and again, Vienna is fairly new at sewing. She's got a month of experience, and this machine has not been working great for her. So let's just see if it will kind of run on its own along this side. Do you want to drive it? or do you? Yeah, you, you, drive you come on. I've been stealing the whole okay. show. I haven't given you a word in edgewise. Do have your hands on the fabric, though, please. Not pulling or pushing too much, just... 
just go ahead and steer and I want you to be comfortable. I can tell us about the video at this point. How's it feel? Better. Okay, cool. Let's have a quick look on the back. A little bit better? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm seeing here right now is it is loose mm -hmm. and our number's at three. So I am just gonna take it up to that four number and then let's just sew a little bit further. We'll be able to see if there's a bit of a change. We know we felt the thread get tighter so we know the tension's working. Okay, and now we have a little bit more of a definitive stitch on the backside. So yeah, um, okay, so that works pretty good. Let's take a few more minutes though and just talk about some of the things that you can play with on the machine. Make sure they're all working while we wrap up the how does the machine really work video. Okay. I never let you ask one question, did I? I'm the worst. I have one. What is your question? What does this do? This over here. Because I see that it correlates with these, maybe? Yes, it does. So that was exactly what we were going to start talking about. So oh. yeah, your, your question is time. Okay, cameraman, can you see across the front here? Yep. Okay. Now, let me be again honest. I don't own this machine. The Kenmore Ultra Stitch 10 here has got some features I recognize and some features I don't. It is color-coded, and I assume they're all going to color-code together. So right now, we've been in this orange mode. And the orange mode here is a straight stitch. We see it as a straight stitch here. I think when I come to this here, it's going to adjust my stitch length. And if I turn it here, I'm not sure, but doesn't that look like the dials got a little bit sh closer together? See what I mean? Like these little bumps are a little closer together than they are up here. They're further apart. So I think this right here is gonna be like a stitch length dial. Okay. So if I'm going to take it all the way to the bottom and test, but we're only going to do science, right? We're just going to go now. If I'm right, it will make a very short stitch or no stitch at all. Okay, so we were correct. Now I can take this a little bit further. And now it's making a shorter stitch than it did earlier. Okay. Reverse, when you hold it, should cause the machine to back up. And reverse is how we make a lock stitch or at the end and the beginning of every seam, we should always lock in our threads so they don't just start to back out as we wash things and stuff. A short stitch, shorter stitch will also help with that. So this is technically your stitch length. Okay. okay. Now this up here is going to be your stitch width selector technically. The needle is in the down position right now, so we always bring the needle to the up position. So I'm going to go a full rotation all the way through to the pelican's own. Okay, now the needle's out, so I can turn this dial, because as I turn this dial, it's going to be moving things side to side. The needles and the fabric, things are going to get ugly quick. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go from a straight stitch to the extreme zigzag. See how that zigzag is tight and narrow, mm -hmm. and this zigzag gets big and wide? Yeah. So that there should give me some sort of a wide style zigzag. Oh, everything comes out nice and smooth because the pelican's home. We're testing, troubleshooting this machine right now. I'm about ready to kick it into an extreme zigzag. If it is out of time, that could bend or break the needle. So I'm going to take my first two stitches by hand so that I don't have motor power. So I'm in here, I'm gonna go one, zig, zag, no bend, no snap, no pop, no click. Okay. I'm gonna hit the gas nice and slow. And the best thing about a zigzag stitch is if your machine will do its extreme zigzag, the timing is not off. Oh, that's yeah, good. yeah, that's a win. <laughs> bonus, right? See the face, and the back looks pretty dang good. Hey, you've got a good sewing machine here. Yeah, this is great. Okay, so now correlating over here when I go into the orange, this probably has to do with the density of the zigzag. So if I keep going here further, it's just showing me it's going to get a wider zigzag. Same thing, you have stitch length control here. If I go way back down smaller, it's going to make a tighter zigzag, right? If we go too tight of a zigzag, it won't advance at all. So a lot of times you're going to have to play with it, make yourself a, a sample. 
Okay, but now if I bring it around, you can see the differences. Mm -hmm. And that was by adjusting the length of the stitch. So then when you get into these green ones here, those are gonna be what's considered a blind hem, right? This is a zigzag that actually, instead of going zigzag, it like zigs, zags, zigs, and it's called a darning stitch. And it's for fixing and mending because what it's doing, anytime you lay thread back and forth over a split or a seam, it's just more secure. And or I was looking and I don't know, well, yes, this yellow version over here is a stretch stitch. Let's do that one and let's wrap this up because I know you've got to get on to your next adventure for the day, okay? So let's go ahead and make sure the needle's all the way up. I'm gonna crank it over here to a straight, but now it's got a bunch of stitches in it. And that's what's called a stretch stitch. And the stretch stitch, actually this might be something that you're excited more about because the stretch stitch is what we use for a garment that has flex. Right, so if you're working on any fabric that's not a firm cotton like I use for quilting, it might have some stretch and give to it. And when you take a straight stitch and you just go straight, 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 and then you pull on it, it will snap. And then if you take the um, straight stitch and you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, when you pull on it, it has more give and or if one thread breaks, it doesn't unravel the whole thing. Okay, so there are other machines called sergers that are used for flexible fabrics like that too. If you don't have a serger, which most folks don't, they'll use the stretch feature on their standard machine. Rock and roll, here we go. Oh, let's go more stitch length. So it's doing it back and forth, back and forth. So it's the slowest way to get anywhere on a sewing machine, <laughs> right? Because you're making three passes for every one stitch. But if you were fixing something that had some lycra or spandex in it, or even maybe putting a in, a in a hoodie or something, something that's like some polar fleece or something. It is a more flexible, more appropriate stitch. And either way, when I'm done, I'm cranking that to the top. Let's bring it around. Now, the other cool thing about that stitch is, is it looks rad. Yeah. <laughs> right? And because your machine is actually a functioning good sewing machine, it is putting the stitch back and forth in the same needle hole. So like, let's say you're doing something with leather and you wanted to do some, or, or even if you're doing with uh, your cottons and you wanted to do like a cool a purse or a, a little clutch or something in your last row of stitching, you wanted to go what we call top stitching around the outside. You can throw that in there. Everything's secured. Nothing's going to move. And you could put on a, a wild color thread and go back and forth a bunch of times and it will actually make for pretty, pretty. Good. Good. Yay. <laughs> Machine's yeah. running. Yeah. Way better, huh? Yeah. Okay. And okay. So then, um, you promise to let me know when you have more sewing questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what did we figure out today? Um, what this is. Yes. Which is what? Will you tell me? The stitch length. Got it. Perfect. The tension knob. Yes. How to correctly thread the thread. <laughs> yeah. Um, how to change the needle. Oh, we didn't talk about winding the bobbin. Oh, okay. But that's okay. For winding your bobbin, it's just going to be up here. It's going to, I want you to figure eight around here so that it doesn't come loose. So you're going to cut the thread here, press your foot's up so your tension's open. You pull the thread out in sewing direction. So basically, then you've got the spool. You're just going to come figure eight back to the bobbin. Okay. And that'll keep more tension. Your bobbin's a little sloppy, so you probably just came around the outside. Mm -hmm. If you figure eight, it pulls it a little in tighter, and it means you get more thread on your bobbin, which means you don't have to rewind it as, so as soon, and it will give you a little bit better stitch. And look nice and tight in there that way. Bobbin tension was on. Everything's golden. Needle's up. I'm going back to straight stitch right there. What's your first sewing project you're going to do on it? Um, a dress. Nice. For my sister. Okay. And then one for me. Nice. Hopefully. Have you picked your fabric already, Vienna? Yes. I oh. think we have one that's, it's like softer than this. Okay. Like, I don't know exactly what it's called. I want you to take these needles home. You're probably going to use something that's got maybe some silks or some, is it kind of shiny a little yeah. bit? Okay, I'm giving you the sharps needles. I'm giving you the sharps needles because the sharps needles have a very aggressive tip on them and they're designed to go through those sensitive fabrics without snagging and stuff. I'm going to find you a size 80 package here um, from the other side of the room in a second. These 70s are a fine needle mm -hmm. and they have to be weighted to your thread. So they'll work with this, but if you're finding that in some of the areas the needle's too fine and it's having a hard time getting through multiple layers, then the 80s I'm going to send you home with will be a great choice too. So yeah, these are great needles and it's actually with a needle I almost always use.
You're so quiet. I, I knew you were going to be shy. You did really, really good. I'm stoked your machine is radical. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Too.